to your knowledge, did Joe Paterno know anything about the investigation in 1998? No. And how do you know that? I mean, how, are, are you confident in that? That he knew nothing? Well, he didn't talk to me about it. Mm -hmm. he never, I mean, he never said a word to me about it in 1998. Uh, I, was on, I was on his staff. I was coaching. I wasn't led to believe by anybody that I talked to that anybody at Penn State like was was talked to necessarily about it other than the officer, Mr. Scheffler, because he was the only person from Penn State that I talked with. In other words, I never talked to any administrator, coach, or any person, I was led to believe that this was such a, it wasn't a, a very significant thing. I mean, it was never made a, a, a huge deal to me from, from anybody at Penn State, including Mr. Scheffler. Now, uh, so that's why I, I, uh, you know, I didn't talk to Tim Curley then, I didn't talk to anybody. So how would I have thought that Joe knew anything? So after the 98 investigation, first, how were you informed that the 98 investigation ended? Do you remember? Well, yeah. It was, uh, well, the only concerns I ever had was for the young man who was involved in this. And when I met with his mother, I was out of concern. I was told that this young man had cancer. I was told that, um, you know, he really liked Penn State football. He asked me to take him to a Penn State football game. Um, then, okay, his mother talked to me a little bit about this. I do not recall saying that some of the things that she said I said or the Sheffler said that I said, but I was upset. I was, I was upset because this young man, I didn't want to do anything to hurt him. I didn't feel that I did anything to hurt him. And I never told anybody that I did anything to hurt him. So, out of the clear blue sky, Scheffler and a man by the name of Laro, Mr. Laro, showed up at the locker room. I was working out. And then we went into a side room, and they talked to me about that incident. I, uh, I don't remember Mr. Scheffler saying much at all. Uh, Mr. Laro from CYS did all the talking, or did not all the talking, but did the vast majority of the talking. He was the one who asked me the questions. He was the one that conducted the interview. At the conclusion of that interview, you know, what I remember was me asking them, they concluded, you know, I remember Mr. Laro saying, well, we've investigated things much more worse than this. Much, much worse than this, not more worse. You know, that we've investigated things much worse than this. That was Laro? Yes. And so was he giving you, you the impression that he didn't think this was a big deal? That was, I mean, I shouldn't say, you know, that they showed up, that was startling to me. You know, that, that they showed up. So in that sense, it was a big deal. But I was left with comfort. You know, my concern was, what do I do with this young man? I didn't want him to have a bad perception. My concern was, uh, you know, he asked me to take him to a football game. Should I take him to a football game? They said, yes, you can take him to a football game because I didn't want to hurt him. Uh, 
And but they said, you know, don't work out with them and don't shower. And I said, well, I'm going to do that. You know, so my total focus was on the young uh, man. Who, who told you don't take a shower with him? I can't remember. I thought both of them did. Okay. You know, don't, don't work out with them. Don't, don't, don't shower Now, this was after the surveillance? Was this after the surveillance episode? Where you were, you were under surveillance? What do you mean by surveillance? In other words, the investigators, they were, you were under surveillance during that episode. I mean, during that, not during the episode, but there, there was an investigation. And you, and are you not aware that you were under surveillance? What do you mean, when I went to his mother's? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, I think that was after the interview. Would, yeah, the interview would have been after um, they, they were in her house. Okay. Because that uh, it happened. The interview happened later than uh, than me going to see her. Okay. And it was it at that. At what time did they tell you? You know what? We've done the investigation and it's over, and you're and you're in the clear. Okay. For that interview, this is my recollection, and I don't have absolutely proof. Absolute proof. Um, they said we will let you know shortly. It was, it was maybe at the most two days, I got a call, or maybe, I think I got a call right away from Mr. Laro. I might have gotten a call the next day or that day from Mr. Laro saying that, you know, this is not going to be founded and it's not, it's not going to be uh, on any kind of record or anything like that. And, uh, and uh, it is unfounded. And then I received in the mail shortly after that notification that this was an unfounded, unfounded. By whom? Do you remember? CYS. It came from Mr. Laro. It came from the Department of Public Welfare. Now he was a state person. He wasn't. He's with children and youth, but he was from the state. Okay. Now you were in, so you were informed there was an investigation going on almost immediately after the episode. Is that correct? No, you were not. No. Okay. Um, no, the only time, I, uh, I mean, I didn't know there was an investigation when I went to see his mother. Okay, so you did not know there was an investigation when you were under surveillance? No. Okay, so let's talk about the mother thing. A lot has been made of, of you saying, I wish I were dead. Sure. Can you explain what context that may have had? Well, number one, I don't remember if I said that. Now, she also said things that weren't true. Uh, she had said something to me when I first came in that Zach had nightmares, uh, or the old man had nightmares, um, and was all upset, made up this big thing about that, which bothered me. You know, it, it bothered me that he had um, that kind of perception. Um, and I certainly felt bad. I didn't want to hurt him. And I may have said something about, you know, you seem upset, you know, I'm sure you're probably not going to forgive me or, or something like that. But, you know, Zach wanted, uh, I'm not supposed to say that. that it, doesn't, no, it doesn't matter. They're adults now, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, but I was told not to say that now. So, the young man uh, wanted to, you know, was anxious to do things, and, and I didn't want... So you don't believe you said, I wish I was dead? I don't think, you know, am I absolutely positive? No, but if, certainly I would guess that I didn't say that. I've never said that along long this... I've never said that to anybody. <laughs> you know, if I... <laughs> After all the things that have happened, if that would have been, there would have been plenty of times I would have said that in the last three years. <laughs> and and uh, it wouldn't have come out. I mean, it just wouldn't have come out that way. Um, now, I felt bad, though. I did feel bad. What did you feel bad about? Because, well, the mother said that you know, at that point, she wasn't sure whether I was, whether Zach was going to be allowed to go to football games or things like that. You know, uh, things that he wanted to do. 
These are things that he wanted to do. And and she didn't have, uh, I mean, she said, you showered with kids. Uh, and I said, yes, I, I've done that. And uh, so she didn't have a good perception of that. She hasn't made a big to-do of that. I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't. Unfortunately, I didn't. <laughs> Um, you know, think much about that. Um, and there was another child in the shower in, during that episode, was there not? No. There was not. No. Okay, because I've been told that there was. There's not. It was just. No. It was just Zach. Okay. Right. And I, you know, then I mean, so I was I was concerned about that, and you know, here I was. I was feeling good about doing something pretty special. I was told this young man had cancer. I, I was told, you know, he loved Penn State football. You know, that's why I gave him Penn State shorts to work on and Joe Paterno's socks, you know. <laughs> you know that, that it was all, and, and I'm, here I am feeling great, and then all of a sudden, like, boom, you know, the, my, the, my bubble burst. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, I, don't, I didn't want to, I didn't want to leave that undone like that. You know, I wanted to continue a relationship uh, with him and and go forward because it was important to me. Um, that was I felt that that was something that I was led to do and 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 wanted to complete it. And uh, and the thing was, you know, the other okay. I go through that, I mean, which I still don't know is there's an investigation going on, you know, like, and now all of a sudden they show up at the locker room, and that was bang, bang. <laughs> okay, it was like, they met with me, boom, it's over. So, what I'm trying to figure out, Jerry, is these emails, because these emails, your recollection is that this was a very quick investigation, correct? Yes, no. Well, yeah, I, I, mean, I, I mean, I don't know how long investigations last. Yeah, relative to what they've done now, it, it was like a snap. You know, I didn't think there was much time to transpire. I don't remember the date. Well, here's, here's why it's, it's important from Paterno's perspective. I'm not probably going to give you the answer you want, but go. That's fine. I'm, I'm just trying to figure out what the truth is, Derry. I mean, yeah. that, whatever happens, happens. I mean, so there's these emails from Tim over the course of a couple of weeks in May of 2008. One saying, I touch base with Coach. Another, Coach is anxious for an update. And... You know, Louis Free presumed that that meant that Joe Paterno was in the loop on this. And I'm just trying to figure out what Curly, if, 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 you know, how involved Curly was, how, if at all, Paterno was. I mean, did Tim Curly ever have a conversation with you about 1998? No. You know, he, now, he mentioned it in 2001. However, he said, that was handled by the authorities. You know, he said um, he didn't get involved. In that. That's what. That's that was what. That was the impression that I had. That that and and that was the only impression. And that was the only feeling I had. That was my understanding. The only I thought the only people that handled it. I didn't even know. I had no idea it went to the district attorney. I had no idea of any of the any of the happenings other than I had no idea that I was being investigated when I went to her home. I had, the only idea I had that this was an issue was in that meeting in the locker room. And that went bang, bang. I mean, it was like, meet with him, unfounded. Okay. Now, did We'll get to 2001, obviously, but I want to, like, I want to go in chronological order here. Okay. But just so I understand, 
It was your impression in 2001 that Tim Curley viewed 1998 as a situation where you had been exonerated. Is that accurate? Oh, yes. Yes. I mean, it is. It was not a focus. Okay, I mean, it was a, a focus. Other than it had happened, you know, that that other people, I mean, I was led to believe, you know, they handled that. And, and, uh, Let me ask you, to me, one of the, the ways to figure out how, what really happened in 98 is what happened with your relationship with victim six or, or Zach and his mother afterwards. I'm, I'm told that you actually continued that relationship with <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm glad you asked. I mean, I maintain the same relationship. He, I mean, uh, he went, I took him to the football games. He asked me to work out, and I didn't. I didn't want to get into that. Um, he, he came to Penn State football games with other kids. I always did, you know, I, I had a bunch of kids at every home football game, all involved in the second mile, most involved in the second mile, some special Olympians. So he came to games, he came to my house. I remember on my last home football game against Michigan, I had a problem. I had didn't have enough tickets for everybody. There are other there were other young men that I had been inviting to these games for a longer period of time. Um, I didn't invite him, so we're driving into the game at Damon's. I see somebody waving at me. That's his mother, and he are standing there. She comes pleading to me, "Could you please take Zach to the game?" I figured I could find a way. It was my last game at home. I figured I could find a way to get him. The, the managers had had allowed for one one person a week to be on the sideline and work kind of as an assistant manager. I figured I could do that. So I said, yeah, I told him. And he went. Following that, I maintained a relationship for 10, 11 years. And obviously his mother was aware and approving of this. Yeah, no, he, he testified something to the effect that she was happy. But she, I talked to her, you know, when I called. I mean, I had no indication. I got tickets for his sister. You had no indication of what? Indication from her that she was, that, that, that she was holding any kind of ill feelings. I mean, why would she... I, I, you know, why would she stop me to take Zach and encourage, encourage Zach to go to games? Why, you know, why, why, why would he continue? It wasn't like he was living at home. He was working at uh, part time at Barnes and Noble after high school. I talked to him. He was planning on going to college. I, I, he came to games. He came with. Alleged victim number seven regularly. They were friends. He and number seven came to games, a lot of games together after they grew up. You know, they they they've grown. They're they're in their twenties and they're asking me for tickets for games. You know, when I'm providing them. He went away to school. We maintained contact throughout that whole time. He would he would call and ask. If he could come to the such and such game, plan this, plan that, and I always obliged. His father was in my home two times with him. His biological father. Now, the mother of, of victim six or, or Zach is a critical figure in this because when after the indictments, I know that whole first week, I'm sure it's such a whirlwind, you probably aren't even aware of this, but but there was a story in a local paper that the mother of victim six and the mother of victim one were very upset with Penn State and Joe Paterno. Now, 
I maintain that that story was inaccurate because, first of all, the mother of victim one was not making statements about Penn State and Paterno. But more importantly, I want to ask you about the mother of victim six. So you've just uh, explained that you had a long relationship with her and, and her son after the investigation was over. No, I, didn't. I had a, a long relationship with her son. I had a cordial relationship. Okay, with but she him. certainly knew. Oh yeah, because he was living at home. Right. I mean, she house. she at some level approved of I this. I drove him home from from games. Okay. So here's my question. She's been very critical, the mother of victim six, has been very critical of Penn State and Joe Paterno. What, what do you make of that in light of the fact that she allowed you to see her boy well after the 1998 investigation? What I make of that is that the 98 thing was forgotten by her. She didn't really deal with it. Now, she wanted more out of it than she got back in 98. I mean, she wanted, she probably wanted this to become a big issue with me, maybe with Penn State back in 98, but couldn't. Why do you say that? She had a lot of financial problems. <laughs> okay. I mean, she, she did she has a horrible financial record. Uh, she's they, they they moved from location to location. Uh, I I don't know what I should be saying. You know she didn't pay bills. Uh, there's liens against her. Things like that. Do you believe that that she was critical of Penn State? when this all broke because she thought that was the place to get money? I think that's a, you know, I think that's certainly a possibility, knowing her circumstances. And, you know, like, uh, um, and, and the other thing, so, but basically that was, now, the media, and, I guess investigators, they bring this whole thing back up. So now the media talks to her, interviews her, and the person who interviewed her was very ambitious, very involved. Okay. Sarah Gannon. Sarah Gannon. Very involved. She contacted, Sarah Gannon contacted her and provided information that neither should have known. How, how do you know that? Discovery. It was brought up at trial. Also, Sarah Gannon <clears throat> refused to testify. It was never Just made clear because I don't think Joe really was able to ask the questions or something like that. She didn't testify. But it was made clear that she said she had information that if she didn't move on this, if she didn't come forward, Sarah had information that if his mother didn't come forward, they were going to drop this thing. And you better get on the stick, in other words. You better start. Sarah Gannon told that to the mother of victim six? Something to that effect. During the grand jury, or? Probably. It was, it was right around the time she wrote the article. Now, let me, I don't know the time. Now, obviously, a lot of the alleged victims are connected to victim six. Do you believe that the mother of victim six was acting as a facilitator of those allegations against you? For a couple of them, yes, possibly. And what makes you believe that? friends with number seven and then uh, number five uh, her daughter knew him uh, and you know I would imagine that there was some sort of communication there the other thing that I was, you know we sponsored number six on a mission trip he asked for money to go on a mission trip when he was in college um, he 
I loaned him my car when he came home for a visit. He sent me text messages, Thanksgiving and Father's Day. And on the text message, it was like, I can't believe you, Kevin, God's let you into my life. Love you. <laughs> you know, that's the kind of, you know, and, and you know, in the summer before, the summer before, we, uh, this is after Sarah Gannon's article. This is in June, July. This is in July. After Sarah Gannon's article comes out. I never said anything to him, but I maintain the same relationship. I would call him or he'd call me every three, four weeks. You know, just to touch base. And then I would say, you know, if you're going to think about coming to a game, let me know so I can plan and have tickets. Uh, he always, he was not bashful about asking. <laughs> he was not bashful about asking. We went out to dinner in July, the July preceding the trial, uh, while he was there with another young man and who was in the second mile. The next day, I had a colonoscopy. He called me the next day asking me about how that went. You know, what in the world? You know, uh, does it make any sense? <laughs> you know. All right. Um, you're getting keep, me fired up. <laughs> you're doing fine. Um, just keep your voice up. All right. Um, did anyone at Penn State, Jerry, ever mention the 98 investigation to you after it was done, or did anyone ever treat you differently at all after that? No. No. I mean, the next thing that happened was my retirement. You know, it was 1999 was my last year. What kind of percent? I mean, okay, when I retired, I had, I had come to the point in my coaching career where I was concerned. I was, I had done everything that I could do as an assistant football coach. I wanted to be a head football coach, but I also had this passion for the second mile. <laughs> okay, I felt good about all of the things that the second mile was doing. So I was a pulled ass person. So I actually, I was trying to resolve my situation. I was concerned that I would have enough energy and motivation to do what was right for the players. I didn't want to do anything. I never did anything haphazard, half-hearted. I poured my guts into everything that I did. That's what I wanted to do. I had to. I didn't. I wasn't going to become. I didn't feel I was going to become the head football coach of Penn State. That had passed, you know. And, and so that wasn't going to happen. So then, what do I do? Well, I tried to start football at Penn State Altoona. Okay, and I said, well, I could become a head football coach. I could not be far removed from the second mile. I could do my. I worked at that. I tried to create that and failed. All right. So now, then at the, about the same time that it failed, this retirement window came available. I was given. I was. I would have been offered five extra years as an incentive to retire. Five years of service. Right. Towards your pension. Right. So maybe. I don't look at that. So I decided and I talked to um, Tim Curley about it, you know. And in the meantime, Tim had talked to me about, well, if you're thinking about getting out of coaching, maybe you want to be assistant athletic director. He talked to me about that. Well, uh, I was never excited about being an administrator. Uh, so. Uh, I said no to that. So now I'm left with that option of retirement. And I chose it. Okay, now when I chose it, why would, oh, what kind of feelings would anybody have? Okay, they, um, they met with me. Now, I, I didn't, I wasn't forced into it at all. I 
that, in fact, I never, I had to make a decision. I didn't want to make the decision when I did. I wanted to make the decision at the end of the football season. Bang, that's all I wanted to do. Well, the retirement window was going to close in June. So I had to make my decision. June of 98? 99. 99. Right. In other words, I had to make a decision in June of 99. Well, when I, you know, when I did, then it became public record or something like that. Well, that's, but I was not forced to, Tim. I talked to Joe that week. Uh, I talked to Tim Curley right before he said, are you sure you're going to make that decision? This was at football camp. I told him, yes. Um, and then I went out to coach and I started crying. <laughs> because I was I, 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 that was something I loved. You know, I just made that decision. Um, but Penn State, I was named an alumni fellow in 19, I think 99. I was named an alumni fellow for my work with the Second Mountain, things like that. I had received other awards from Penn State. Human Service Award. I was uh, I was granted. Like, I understood it was an exception, but I was granted emeritus. I was I did have faculty rank. I was granted as an emeritus, and then I had a dinner. I was recognized by the quarterback club. Right. I was. I want to get into. The, I want to take this and make sure I, I'm still going chronological order because I want to get into the retirement a little bit more. But I want to make sure. Do you know whether or not the second mile was ever? informed about the 98 investigation and was there any you know, not until 2001 same same so i never mentioned it to them they never mentioned it to me nobody ever mentioned it to them does that seem odd that you would be invested something forget about you for a second i mean if that somebody would be investigated by by all these agencies and that that the second mile uh, I mean, Zach was a second mile kid, was he not? Well, he wasn't. He wasn't heavily involved. He, he went to what was called a friends program. Okay, but I mean, well, does it surprise you? Does it surprise you that the second mile wouldn't be informed of of such an investigation? No, no, because like I said, my perception of what happened wasn't what's come out. You know, I, I, you, know you thought it was no big deal. Yeah. I mean, you know, this kid is chasing me. He's wanting to do things with me. He's a part of my life. I'm helping him. I'm, I'm going on with what I set out to do. I, uh, I have his father in my house. I have my sister. You know, I mean, why, why would I, why would I? But the second mile was informed in 2001 of, the, of 98 as well. Right. I believe. Tim, well, yeah, I'm, sh I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure, I mean, that would have been by, yeah, yeah. So you're sure that Tim told the second mile in 2001 about both 2001, the McCleary episode, and the Zach episode? Right, and I talked to the second mile about 98 and 2 in 2001. Okay, um, we'll get to that, and I want to keep it in ground, I want to get back to that, okay. Um... All right, now before we get to the retirement, um, what was your understanding of why you were not charged in 98? Well, the last thing that was in my head was what I felt Mr. Laro said. We, we, we've seen so many more worse things than this. You know, so they didn't, that was the feeling I had, like it wasn't, you know, I was, again, I was focused on the young man, you know, right. what can I do for him, but, you know, I don't want to mess up here, I, 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 that, that's why, I mean. Did your behavior change at all after 98? I mean, were you more careful after 98? My behavior didn't didn't change drastically. No, no. I mean, it didn't change drastically. Um, 
You would, you would indicate. I didn't put it this way. I the way it's been portrayed was that, you know, like I did all of this showering. <laughs> and uh, I did shower occasionally with kids after 98. There were times when they would come do activities I wouldn't shower. There were times, uh, there were a few times that I did, not nearly as many as was alluded to or presented by those who made the accusations. Not, not, not but, but you had indicated that with regard to victim six, you he asked you to work out after that and you decided not to do right, it. Because that was my focus and I clearly understood what I should do with him. I mean, so your behavior did change with him, right. but not in general. Right. Okay. Right. All right. Um, okay. Do you have any recollection of, of having contact with the during that investigation with the therapist Chambers or CSOC? You had no. They neither of them con had any inter interaction with you. CSOC did not have any. Chambers did not interview you. Yeah. Really? Okay. I, I I was under the impression that they did. Yeah, I mean, Chambers made all these conclusions without even talking to me. <laughs> I, I never met with her once. She only I think she met more with the mother than anybody. So know. you never met with Chambers. You're yeah. sure of that? Never had a conversation. What? Never had a conversation? Never, I wouldn't have known who she was until her name came up at, right before trial. Okay. And CSOC you never had any contact with. Okay. Um, who was your contact person regarding the 98 in investigation? Did you have... Mr. Laura. Mr. Laura. Yeah. But there was one... The only contact was the meeting and the phone call. Right after the meeting. That was it. Okay. And of course, you know, I've actually battled with a Sports Illustrated reporter, Jerry, um, who who has written and still never corrected that the allegation in 98 was that you raped a boy in the shower. Um, and, and he acknowledges that that's not accurate, but he didn't correct it. What, how does that, how, what's your reaction to that? Uh, after this experience, nothing surprises me. I didn't know he said that, but there's been so many things, so many words thrown out there, so many monster-creating terms <laughs> been thrown out that nothing surprises me what was said. Is it frustrating? Anger? Does it still anger you, or is it, are you beyond that? <laughs> I'm beyond that, but you know, when you mention it, it's in my craw. <laughs> you know, the hurt, the the pain, the, the anger, all the emotions, you know, come out <laughs> when uh, when you mention things like that. And I think about how this all transpired. <laughs> you know, when, yeah. <laughs> But I'm, I'm beyond that. You know, that's done. <laughs> you know, all I want is another chance. <laughs> the chance at what? Another trial to get, to be able to do the kind of job we would be able to do. To bring up things that work. To get things out that were never paid attention to, were ignored, or not presented. And to to be able to present a different view, a different account of things. But I don't know if anybody's going to listen. <laughs> Do you think they will? That's a that's a that's a tough road. I agree with you. I don't I don't think anyone's going to listen. Unfortunately. I mean, I'm trying. I'm. I mean, I've had a tough enough time trying to, to get people to understand that Joe had nothing to do with this. I mean, uh, and so I mean, it's it's amazing how 
people have a view of this and they just don't want to change it. I mean, it's once they decided. I mean, it's and I think well, that you read some books and things, you understand why. Why do you think that is? What, what's your explanation? Well, I mean. You have to read the book Victims of Memory, and and and, and then I've written I've written my version of what that book meant relative to what happened to me and what transpired when one person started the whole thing. The young man from Lock Haven. He started the whole thing, and if you knew about him. And you know what a storyteller, what a drama person he is. If you knew that... Victim number one. Yeah. You know, he made up a whole story at school. I have a video of him creating a, a, a whole story. Like that he was going to be attacked by somebody. And that he was held prisoner. <laughs> uh, I have... You know, then he then comes into the school and makes up this whole thing. When they investigate it, there's no information to substantiate what he said. Then his mother said the next day he's run off the road when he has a car accident by this person who was trailing him. If, you know, that's where it all started. And it, and it started out very small. You know, it didn't start out the way it ended. You know, and, and then... You know, he's a person, you know, he had all these problems and everything else. He gets into a fight with a kid shortly after this because he called the kid gay. Now, what the? Does that make any sense? <laughs> okay. After he had all these things happen to him, now he's going to call somebody gay. He used that term free. Uh, and then, then it just went on. Okay. And then it just took off from there, and then the media. Everybody, the psychologists, and the civil attorneys, and everybody got involved. Right. Now, it's a rage, you know. It's a theme right now. You know, it's a big, it's a big public. Uh, you know, the public makes fast judge the media. It isn't important accurate. It's important first, and then okay. And then they, and then opportunities existed to make this bigger and better, and, and and they took advantage of that. So then, and the Penn State, their reaction to it, they called these kids victims. It wasn't supposed to be victims. They were supposed to be alleged victims. Well, right away, I mean, uh, how else were you know every, all the information? They were bombarded with information. So, and, and it's an issue that it's kind of, there's a craze about it. You know, it, it's become, the world today is much different than the world I grew up in. These kids are much different, I've learned, than what I, their perceptions, you know, like to be asked by Bob Costas, the question I was asked, I never thought in terms of, was I attracted to, I mean, I was devastated at that point in time. All the things that happened, I never thought in terms of being attracted to kids like that sexually. It, it, it was the furthest thing from my mind. My world, <laughs> I was not oriented like the world is today where sex is this and that. And if you're this, if you're that, if you're heterosexual, homosexual, or whatever. That was not my world. I never thought about that. My world was athletics and what I could do there. My world was what I could help these kids, not sexually attracted to them. You know, I was taken back by the realization of some things that were said. All right. Um, let's go back to the retirement. My understanding is that the process actually began technically before the 98 investigation. That according to Joe's notes, he had spoken to you before that 
and said to you something along the lines of, you got to make a decision between second mile and Penn State football, and you know, you're not going to be the head coach. Is that, does that jive with your recollection? Joe and I had occasional conversations um, about my future. I those those conversations could have been when relative to uh, starting football at Penn State Altoona, you know. Well, they, according according to so you know, because you haven't read the free report. In the free report, there are notes from Joe. Taught, uh, that are before the 98 investigation in 98 indicating that he had spoken to you and that the process for your retirement was going to begin. Does that not jive with, I mean, and I understand that there were, that, that was not the final, final decision, but that the process had begun, that, that you guys had had well, talked. He said before 98. No, no, no. It was early 98, but it was before the 98 investigation. The 98 investigation is May of 98. I believe, according to these notes, Joe, I think it might have been February of 98, indicates that he talks to you and that there needs to be a decision between Penn State and the second mile and that you're not going to be the head coach and things well, along. You have, you know, if you can find out when the retirement window became available. See, I mean, I talked to Joe about starting football at Penn State Altoona. Mm -hmm. In fact, Joe and I and Graham Spanier met about it. We had a meeting about that. Um, so you're not quite sure of the timing is what I'm getting. No, because, I mean, I, my recollection was, you know, I was... I was hoping to do the thing at Penn State Altoona. When that fell through, then there was a period of time, maybe, I don't know. Well, let, 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 let's, let's, let's piece it together. If, you're gonna, if you wanted to do the Penn State Altoona thing, I believe you said earlier that that was because that would allow you to do more work with the second mile. Yeah, it would be removed from the area. Right. And so, my piecing it together, that sounds like, in your mind, that might have been a compromise situation. Right. Absolutely. Okay, so you get to keep coaching. You're still able to do the second mile thing, but it just didn't work out. They never got a football program at, at Altoona. Right. Okay. All right. Uh, you know, and, and, and but the most important part of this is, in no way, shape, or form, was your retirement related to the 1998 investigation, was it? No. Not to my knowledge. I mean, you know, unless, <laughs> unless, you know, indirectly people will, might have been, would have been saying things, but I don't think. I never got that feeling. I never got that feeling like I was forced to retire. I, you know, <laughs> like I said, they, they honored me at the quarterback club. They gave me Meredith, you know, I mean, they, 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 they gave me a long night fellow. Right. And, and of course, if you if you follow the logic here, you coached two more seasons after the '98 investigation, right? Which doesn't seem to fit the pattern of someone who's been forced to retire. You wouldn't think, would you? <laughs> um, I mean, I, Tim Curley met with me the day I that that I remember the day being you know because I remember what happened to me you know. I mean, it was Tim, and, and he was still saying, are you sure you want to do this? You know, and I said something to the fact, you know, I, I, I said something about, you know, and, and, and that was the most conclusive statement. I wasn't going to become the head football coach at Penn State. You know, so that, the last meeting I had with Tim, he told me that. I don't think I'd ever had that conversation with Tim. You know, now with Joe, you know, um, I mean, Joe talked to me at various times about the second mile and, and, and you know, 
uh, at one time I was, you know, I was told that I would probably, you know, become the head football coach, and then time passed, and then, you know, and then... By Joe? Joe told you that? Well, you know, he, he said that, you know, it would obviously have a good chance, like after 1986 and things like that, and I was a, a big deal <laughs> at that time. And uh, so, yeah, you know, the, the, that possibility was certainly there. And then over time, then... But Joe at one point does tell you you're not going to be the next head coach at Penn State, correct? I remember Tim telling, you know, concluding that. I remember Joe kind of, it wasn't as absolutely positive, but, you know, the indication was that, you know, because um, it probably would have come up in our discussions about Altoona, you know, and things like that. And, and, and Fran Ganner had been offered a job at Michigan State, and if Joe retired, I felt like, you know, that Franny might get the job. By the way, he retired yesterday. That's what I heard, yeah, my wife told me. Um, <clears throat> so, so you know, I can't remember what okay. exactly he told All me. All right. Um, there's been a lot of media speculation that because you retired over a year after this investigation that and that you never coached again after that, that those two events must somehow be related. Is, is that accurate? No. Why not? That I didn't coach anywhere else? Mm -hmm. Well, because I, I chose to uh, spend an active role fundraising and doing things with the second mile. But I still love coaching. I did football camps. You know, I did football camps. I volunteered at high school. I spoke at clinics. I, I did a lot of football things. You know, I would talk to coaches. I went over to Juniata College. Um, I helped out there. I, I, you know, I did a lot of football things to satisfy um, my, my yearning, you know, for coaching. And, and, you know, I spoke at clinics. Now, I've been told... Um, that you actually did have other job offers after you retired. Um, and by one count, I've, I've been told you had three solid offers. Um, is that accurate? No. Okay. Well, how many did you actually have? Well, it depends how you look at it. <laughs> it's a story in and of itself. Oh, I don't want the full story. Just, okay. give, me, just give me the... I was offered an agreement by the University of Virginia to be their head football coach. And why didn't and that, and is it true that that fell through because over a dispute over how much time you could spend with the second mile? Well, I was offered this agreement. I didn't sign the agreement. I wanted. I didn't have an attorney. I didn't have anybody look at the agreement. I. I. Did, I. I, uh, I was. Struggling, I was trying to see if somehow the second mile could expand into Charlottesville, Virginia, or something like that. Um, and I couldn't deny to those people or to anybody that the second mile wasn't important to me. Being a head football coach was important. The second mile was important. I was a complex person. My family is extremely important. Uh, you know. My mother's situation at that time probably was an issue too. There's 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 a lot of things. Um, so I'm struggling, and I bring the agreement back home. And then in the meantime, I get a phone call from a friend who was helping me, saying they want to come back up and meet with you, the people from Virginia, and. Uh, they came back up and met with me, and they asked questions, and, and they asked questions about, um, I'm still a candidate for that job, but I hadn't signed the, this agreement. I don't know what would have happened if I had signed the agreement. I had talked to an attorney. We had talked about the things that we were going to ask, you know, but now there was, it was, it was uncertainty as to whether I was their person anymore.
Why was that? Because of the second mile considerations? It's possible. It's possible. You know, did, yeah, did they ever ask you about anything related to 1998 oh, investigation? No. No. You have, so there's zero connection to that investigation as to why you didn't get or accept Why would they have offered me an agreement? I'm just asking. I mean, there, there, there's, there's no connection as far as you know to why that job didn't happen. Right. Right. Well, I think it was, you know, I had expressed my interest in the second mile to them, and they were concerned maybe a little bit. Well, here's, the other, the other, here's what really happened. Okay. I'm wavering a little bit. Okay. I didn't like the way it all transpired. I lived in a fishbowl at Penn State. That world was a lot different. The, the way they were making their decisions, the things they were forcing upon me, and then all the things bothered me. I didn't feel that, not that money meant any, that anything, but they weren't going to pay me what was... The, so there were a lot of things that went into why that job didn't happen. Yeah, I had a lot of questions. I went back and we had to develop a plan for me to ask. You know, what the things that I was going to ask for the next time I met with them before I signed. Okay, and then, so then, I, I'm, I'm dragging my feet, and they became concerned, and then Al Grow was on the search committee for the job. Now, they, they're communicating with him along the way. Now, he realizes he's going to get fired. So, he throws... I'm meeting with the business manager, and I said something happened because his tone changed when I was down there. You know, this is when he gave me the agreement, and the business person gave me the agreement, and he was called out of the office, and he come back with a different demeanor. He had given me the agreement, but it wasn't like the, it wasn't the same feeling. What do you think happened? Al Grove called and said what? I'm interested in the job. Ah. Okay, and he ended up getting it. Yeah, so they went from me, they came up and talked to me, and they went right to Al Grove. They hired him that night, the day after they met with me. Ah. See, Al Grove became concerned about his future. <laughs> so you were in the middle of a meeting, and, and Al Grove calls and says, I'm interested in the job. Well, I don't know that. I'm speculating. Okay. He was, he was hired immediately after that. Well, a few days after that, he, he, he was hired immediately after the, they came back up to State College and met with me. Okay, see, this still dragged. I have okay. questions. And then, did you, we, did, okay, I, I don't, the, the details aren't that important. But were there, was there interest from other schools ever other than Virginia after you retired? Uh, I talked to the people at Bucknell. So they, they approached you? Yeah, yeah, they did. Okay, so clearly there was not rumors that were circulating within the football community about Jerry Sandusky at this time that would prevent anyone from reaching out to you. No, okay. Did anyone else ever reach out to you? During that time? No. Okay. Only... But you weren't pursuing jobs either because you were happy with the second mile. Well, we were in a big fundraising campaign, so mm -hmm. no, I wasn't wrapped up in that. All right, a couple other quick questions on 98, then we'll move on. If Joe Paterno had thought in 1998 that you might be a pedophile, even though you weren't charged, would he have allowed you to coach two more seasons after that? I don't know the answer to that question. I, I believe, knowing Joe Paterno, he wasn't bashful about asking or questioning. <laughs> you know, I mean, Joe was not, did not have ulcers, but he was a carrier. <laughs> That's what he would say. So, you know, if, if, if he was worried about something, I think he would have expressed it. But, but, if, but knowing him like you do, had he thought, had a suspicion that you were a pedophile, would he have let you coach two more years? No, I don't think. Yeah. I mean, you know, if he thought, if he absolutely thought I was, I 
say no. 